आदरणीय राधा बहन जी श्री दिवेटिया जी मंदा बहन मयंक भाई मित्रों भाइयों और बहनों सबसे पहले मैं क्षमा याचना आपके सामने रखता हूँ क्योंकि मैं न गुजराती में बोलूँगा न हिंदी में बोलूँगा अंग्रेजी में बोलूँगा तो मैं आपसे निवेदन करता हूँ कि आप मुझे माफ़ करें क्योंकि जो मैं कहना चाहता हूँ शायद आ, अंग्रेजी में ही अच्छी तरह से कह पाऊंगा इसलिए मैं आपसे माफी चाहता हूं ऑफ कोर्स आई थैंक ऑल ऑफ यू फॉर कमिंग इट इज अ प्रिविलेज टू स्पीक टू एन ऑडियंस इन अहमदाबाद अहमदाबाद इज मे हैव फॉरगॉटन बट आई हैव नॉट फॉरगॉटन दैट फ्रॉम एन आश्रम इन अहमदाबाद ए करंट ऑफ मॉरल पोलिटिकल सोशल इकोनॉमिक रेवोल्यूशन वेन टू द होल वाइड वर्ल्ड so it's a very great privilege to me uh, to speak here and it's a very great privilege to speak in memory of and in honor of ramlal bhai being a student of history i am aware of the commitment of the late ramlal bhai of his ceaseless service to the people of gujarat and india in education and public life i had the privilege of meeting him a few times i do thank mandab and parik and all those associated with the indian society of community education for giving me this opportunity to remember and all our ramlal bhai and to share with this audience a few reflections on on what history may teach us many of us turn to history not so much to know what happened but to find confirmation for our views of what happened if we don't find that confirmation we regret the time wasted and in our minds we curse the historian across the world the steady flow of historical information and historical insights has not removed the prejudices and biases of human kind we believe what we wish to believe knowing all this some people still do historical research largely for their own personal satisfaction but also perhaps with the hope and prayer that a few readers might say to themselves oh i did not know that you will not be surprised to learn that my study of history is limited yes i have done some study i have done study for the biographies uh, mayank bhai mentioned these raja ji sardar patel badshah khan gandhi ji this is the order in which i wrote the biographies i have done some study also of the clashing forces of revenge and reconciliation throughout india's history i've done some study of the lives and politics of sir sayed ahmed khan the poet iqbal maulana mohammad ali jinnah saheb maulana azad sher e bangla fazlul haq liaqat ali khan and dr zakir hussain i've researched for my comparative study of india's 1857 revolt and the american civil war and now for my history of undivided punjab from the time of aurangzeb to the time of mount batten However I have not spent enough time to reflect on the lessons I might have picked up during this limited study. I was asked a few months ago by Amanda Ben to give a Ramlal Parik memorial lecture but by that time I was already fully committed to my teaching and to my Punjab research and I warned Amanda Ben very frankly that she should be prepared for an inadequately prepared lecture. You will therefore get a half cooked meal. I seek your indulgence. because of my recent involvement with punjab several of my examples will be from punjab so gujaratis and others kindly forgive me i will divide this talk on some lessons from our history into five portions the headings for these five portions are as follows one set back and at times tragedy after a great struggle this has been our experience quite a few times that's one portion second seeing fellow indians not the empire as the primary foe during the freedom struggle seeing fellow indians not the empire as the primary foe during the freedom struggle three failure to find solutions at ground level seeking solutions from the all india level four rejecting potential allies judging them to be unworthy practicing political untouchability five Why has India remained a democracy a highly unsatisfactory democracy no doubt but a democracy nonetheless so these are the five headings 
So the first one, great struggles followed by setbacks, sometimes by tragedy. After 1857, uh, we all know that after 1857 there was a tremendous division, especially the Hindu-Muslim divide. Some British historians blamed Muslims for the revolt. Other British historians blamed Hindus for the revolt. And Hindus and Muslims both responded by saying, we did not take the initiative, they did. Desires to embrace the empire and run away from fellow Indians of the other community became strong. To give you one example, uh, some of you have heard of Bharti Hindu Harish Chandra, one of the great uh, founders of Hindi literature. Uh, so he had some colleagues, and one of them was Radhacharan Goswami. And this is what he says uh, near the end of the 19th century, in the 1890s. And he writes about 1857. He says, Yama created a special hell for the rebels of 1857. Similarly, many Muslim writers try to distance themselves from the revolt and to say that Hindus did the revolting. Secondly, in all communities, the watchword became not harmony or moderation, but purity. Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs all felt that somehow if we become purer in our religion and simultaneously develop our relations with the empire, things will improve. That our mistake was that we were not Hindu enough, we were not Sikh enough, we were not Muslim enough. This double aim, guarding their community against perceived threats from other communities, while building relations with the British, was nursed by all three communities, Muslim, Sikh, and Hindu in Punjab, and by different communities across India. Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan was perhaps the leading Muslim guide in the last three decades of the 19th century. His line was, all Muslims must unite and they must build good relations with the British. He had a friend called Alan Octavian Hume. Both were in UP, what we now call UP. Uh, Hume, the man rightly regarded as one of the founders of the Indian National Congress. When Hume succeeded after being thrown out of government in encouraging his numerous Indian friends, including many in Calcutta, to launch the International Congress, Sayyid Ahmad Khan spent much energy in opposing the new body. He was shocked by Congress's demands for a place for elected members on local and provincial councils and for greater opportunities for Indians to enter the civil service. Expressed at several public meetings, Sayyid Ahmad's opposition sprang from fear. Men from the lower classes he thought would win in elections. He thought that Bengali Hindus, better educated than other communities, would monopolize the civil service. And India run by Indians would be dominated by Hindus, he thought, who were more numerous than Muslims. It was much better that Britons continue to govern far into the future, and Muslims at any rate should stay out of the Congress. This was his view. Uh, this is what he said in Lucknow, 18 December 1887. Would our, would our aristocracy like that a man of low caste or insignificant origin, though he be a BA or MA, and have the requisite ability, should be in a position of authority above them, have power in making laws that affect the lives and property? Never. Nobody would like it. A seat in the council of the viceroy is a position of great honor and prestige. None but a man of good breeding can the viceroy take as his colleague, treat as his brother, and invite to entertainments at which he may have to dine with dukes and earls. So he wants the English to continue for a very long time. Like Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, there was the brilliant, remarkable, great Bankim Chandra Chatterjee in Calcutta. Like Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, he was also an officer in the judicial service of the British Raj. His line was that India's Hindus should concern themselves with building a Hindu nation rather than in India for all its inhabitants. For building it, Hindu texts offer a foundation and British rule provides a very powerful scaffolding. Yes, Hindus should master science and learn, if need be from the West, how to acquire power and how to use force. They should not oppose the British. This is the line of Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. Now, 
Alan Octavian Hume, the Scotsman who was here, who was thrown out of the administration, and his colleagues such as Dadabhai Navroji, Surendranath Banerjee, Badruddin Tayyabji, they thought that Indians, not Hindus as such, but Muslims as such, should come together. The Indian National Congress had its first meeting in Mumbai in December 85. Pune was to be the venue, but plague forced a change. Fortunately, Bombay was ready, and the Gokuldas Tejpal Sanskrit College Trust offered its buildings above Gowalia Tank in central Bombay for the first Indian National Congress. Of the very close on 100 gentlemen present, 38 came from six centers in the Western Presidency, 21 from different places in the Southern Presidency, three from Calcutta, three from different towns in Punjab, seven from towns in UP. The rest, close to 30, were Indian officials. Now, the gathering was totally unusual for the time. Writing in the Bombay Gazette, a European onlooker referred to, quote, the men from Madras, the blackness of whose complexion seemed to be made blacker by spotless white turbans, bearded, bulky, large-limbed men from the north, Marathas in their cart wheel turbans, stalwart Sindhis from Karachi, Parsis in a headdress which they themselves have likened to a slanting roof. Only about 70 Indians were meeting apart from the Indian officials. Only 70 people. Yet of this humble event, a far-seeing observer made the following prediction in the journal in Lucknow called the Hindustani in January 1886. When the historian of the future sets himself to write, he will not fail to mention prominently the 28th, 29th, 30th, December 85, when the various forces of the country were brought together. We very often use the word nation. We know also that there are many British persons who will not believe that there is anything like a nation in India. But if any of these gentlemen had been present at the National Congress in Bombay, he would have been convinced of the existence of something like a nation in India. The assembling of Sindhis, Punjabis, Bengalis, Madrasis, Gujaratis, Marathas, Parsis, Marwaris, Hindus and Muslims under the same roof and for a common object is by no means a trifling thing. Now the empire understood that this gathering of 70 people was quite a significant thing. So the Viceroy, Lord Curzon, what does he decide? He decides to counterattack. He sp says privately that his aim is to take the Congress to a peaceful demise. By the way, when I speak to, of the INC in the 1880s, I'm not necessarily referring to the INC today. So he hoped to bring the INC to a peaceful demise. Part of his strategy was to split the large province of Bengal, where Hume and others had done much of their work, into two. So in 1905, Bengal was broken into two provinces, a western half inclusive of Bihar and Orissa, with a large Hindu majority, and an eastern half inclusive of Assam, where Muslims outnumbered Hindus. Whatever the truth or untruth in the claim of Curzon that he was splitting Bengal for administrative convenience, many Hindus saw an intention to weaken a growing nationalist movement. Opposition was expressed through a boycott of British goods and campaigns for Swadeshi. Not many of you may be aware, but several of you would be aware of this great movement of 1905, 1906, 1907 uh, in Bengal and in much of India. The 1905 defeat of Russia by Japan had boosted the sense that Asians could stand up to Europe. This was the time when poet Rabindranath Tagore, born in eastern Bengal, came out with his Amar Shonar Bangla. This was the time when Bande Mataram, the refrain in Bankim Chandra Chatterjee's song in praise of Bengal, became the rallying cry of the opponents of Bengal's partition. Moreover, in parts of eastern India, bands of Hindus employed the politics of assassination between 1908 and 1910. The ferment over Bengal was not confined to Bengal. The International Congress asked for the division to be annulled. From Punjab, Lala Lajpat Rai entered the fray, so did Bal Gangadhar Tilak from Pune. With the orator Bipin Chandra Pal sh sharing the leadership in Bengal, newspapers spoke, as you all know, of Lal Pal 
Pal. But this was not the whole story. Not only were most of Bengal's Muslims happy with the Muslim majority province in the East, there were some exceptions, but the majority of Bengal's Muslims seemed very happy with the Muslim majority province in the East. Muslims across India were troubled by the Hindus' opposition to a Muslim majority province. Some remembered that the novel Anandamat, where Bankim's Bande Mataram first appeared, had an unmistakable anti-Muslim tinge. They became very pessimistic. However, and this is the interesting thing to, to, to focus on, nobody attempted a serious Hindu-Muslim dialogue at that point. Neither Muslims, nor Hindus, neither Punjabis, nor Bengalis, nor Maharashtrians. What was accomplished after this was not a dialogue between Muslims and Hindus, but a dialogue be between Muslim leaders and the Viceroy in Shimla, Karzan's successor, Minto. This was the background. October 1906, several Muslim leaders from different parts of India, led by a very young Aga Khan, he was then 29 years old, they met the Viceroy in uh, Simla, and they said, we want separate electorates. If there are to be elections to councils in provinces, councils in cities, Muslims should be represented, should be voted into these only by Muslims. And the Viceroy said, yes, we will do this. Uh, the text of this memorandum from this delegation was made available to the Viceroy before the delegation met him. The Viceroy had consultations with London about the reply to be given, and the reply was organized. Yes, we will do this. We will have separate electorates. So this historic commitment for separate electorates had been obtained even as the Indian National Congress and most politically conscious Hindus across India were busy demanding the reunification of Bengal, but Sir Syed Ahmad's ideological successors walked off with the prize of a separate Muslim electorate in India as a whole. And as many of you will know, writing straight away to the Viceroy, an unnamed British official said, I must send Your Excellency a line to say that a very, very big thing has happened today. A work of statesmanship that will affect India and Indian history for many a long year. It is nothing less than the pulling back of 62 million of people, that was India's Muslim population at the time, from joining the ranks of the seditious opposition, the Congress. Now this Simla coup was followed three months later by the founding in Dhaka of the All India Muslim League. In 1909, the so-called Minto Morley reforms were unveiled in an act of parliament in London. So this act permitted the election of a few Indians to provincial councils, to a new All India Imperial Legislative Council, with the franchise restricted to sections of the propertied and the educated. So while Muslims would have reserved seats and a separate electorate, Europeans and loyal Indians nominated by the Raj would comprise the majority in each council. The empire also agreed with the League that in the councils, a minority community, Hindu minorities in Punjab, Muslim minorities in UP, etc., would have weightage, that is a representation larger than what the population ratio warranted. This is an important thing to remember. Now, since consistent support to Muslim demands violated divide and rule, the empire played an opposite card within two years. This, the Viceroy had told this delegation in Simla that East Bengal will remain, but in 1911, the Bengal partition was annulled. Bengali-speaking areas were reunified. So the undoing of partition shocked Muslims in Bengal and elsewhere in India. It was alleged that terror had been appeased. Already restive over European attacks on portions of the empire of the world's premier Muslim power, Turkey, Already this was happening in 1911. Indian Muslims now harbored a powerful new grievance. So this is what happened after 1857. This is what happened after this great Lal Bal Pal movement in 1905-1906. Now let's discuss the non-cooperation movement. S 
started from here. It shook the empire. But there were problems after that. Tempests came from more than one direction. In August 1921, Malayali speaking, quote unquote, Mopla Muslims, as they were called in those days in Malabar, rose first against the government and then against the Hindu landlords. Many Hindus were killed and others were forcibly converted. A full scale military action by the Raj resulted in the deaths of a very large number of Muslims. Local in origin and aim, the rebellion had nothing to do with Khilafat or non cooperation. And for some time, the rest of India knew very little about it. Yet, as stories of murder and forcible conversion traveled across the land, Hindu Muslim trust took a hit. And then there was the suspension of non cooperation. These 22 policemen were brutally killed in Eastern UP. And Gandhiji decided to suspend the movement. And that created a very big reaction. Many people were very critical of the suspension. And tried in Ahmedabad for sedition, Gandhi was sentenced for six years. Now, before his death in August 1920, Lokmanya Tilak had said to Gandhiji that you're asking too much from the Indian people. And in a way, Gandhi was asking a lot, and the Indian people were not willing to do all that Gandhi was asking. What was Gandhi asking? Nonviolence, don't harm the British, embrace prison, have Hindu Muslim unity, give up titles, give money, abolish untouchability. Each item on this long list was difficult. In contrast, collaboration with the Raj bought, brought gains, profit. And there was political profit too in the Hindu Muslim divide. So the Ali brothers drifted away from Gandhi and the Indian National Congress. So would Hindu leaders like Swami Shraddhanand. To a lesser degree, so did Lajpat Rai. To many Muslims and Hindus, the empire once more, even after Jalniawala, where perhaps a thousand Hindus, Muslim Sikhs, shed their blood jointly, even after Jalniawala, the empire seemed a better partner than the other community. Not, however, to all Muslims or to all Hindus. Despite the defeat of non-cooperation, a good number from all faiths remained committed to a united struggle for independence. Even those who abandoned the joint struggle acknowledged the value of the three-year experience. As a future biographer of Muhammad Ali, Afzal Iqbal would write, those events formed a psychological watershed in the development of modern India. For the first time, India witnessed a mass movement which shook the country and nearly paralyzed the British rule. <coughs> For the first time, India realized a new pride and discovered a sense of unity. For the first time, in a rare manifestation of amity and accord, Hindus and Muslims drank from the same cup. But there was a setback after the great battle. There was similarly a great setback after Quit India 1942, we all know that. Quit India took place in 1942. It was a tremendous movement. And yet, uh, partition came within five years. So what lessons do we draw? Do we draw the lesson that there should be no struggle if a struggle is followed by setback and sometimes by tragedy? That everyone should have accepted British rule as permanent? That was not possible. Even if Lal Bal Pal or Gandhi had said, let us call off the struggle, others would have demanded a struggle. There would have been a struggle, not led by the people who led the struggle. You cannot ask a wave from rolling. Waves will roll. What could have been done? Obviously, more attention could have been given to building the Indian community along with fighting the British. Lasting unity cannot come from enmity. A struggle creates excitement, but lasting unity has to be worked for. That is why Gandhi had his constructive program. That is why Ramlal Parikh and hundreds of other amazing people dedicated their lives for a constructive program. But a constructive program was not exciting. 
Without a common positive program, division grows. Political struggles are exciting but divisive. Constructive program is dull but unifying. When the struggle was called off, many people felt depressed, but not the constructive workers. They were not depressed. They were not frustrated. They were not divided. They continued. But the constructive program did not embrace too many Indians. It embraced a wonderful group of dedicated Indians, but it did not embrace enough of Indians. So that is a, a, a broad thing to reflect upon. There will be other conclusions that others will draw. Okay. Now let us learn from the fact, this is the next section, that throughout India's freedom movement, many Indians prefer to negotiate with the empire rather than with fellow Indians. Fellow Indians were seen as the primary phone of the empire. We all know about the 1947 killings, especially in Punjab, where half a million, maybe even more, were killed in both sections of Punjab. You know, today we think of Punjab uh, and we have Haryana and we have Himachal. But let me remind you that there was a time when Punjab, our Punjab, and Himachal and Haryana were all East Punjab. And then there was West Punjab. And the two together formed the big Punjab, the undivided Punjab, which once upon a time Maharaja Ranjit Singh ruled, and which then the British ruled. And before that, there were other things happening there. And it was in March of 1947, that the first large-scale killings took place in the Multan area, in the Rawalpindi area, in the Atak area. About 3,000 people were killed, and most of them were Hindus and Sikhs. That was when the Sikhs in Punjab, the Hindus in Punjab, and the Indian National Congress said what? This is before Mountbatten has come to India. The killings take place. What does the Congress then ask in March of 1947? What do the Sikhs in Punjab ask in 1947? What do the Hindus in Punjab ask in 1947? Who knows this? They ask for a partition of Punjab. They say that we will not live in Muslim majority areas. And the, Punjab must be partitioned. Bengal must be partitioned. So when Jinnah Sahib and the Muslim League had said, we want partition of India, the Congress had said, no, no, no. But when these killings took place, the Indian National Congress said, Punjab must be partitioned, Bengal must be partitioned, and therefore India must be partitioned. Sorry? OK. Um, now, at this time, some people in Lahore, Muslims, Hindu Sikhs, formed a peace committee. But it was uh, not particularly active. But there was one Sikh politician called Sardar Ujjal Singh. He went to see the governor of Punjab at the time. He was a man called Jenkins, a very interesting governor. Ujjal Singh says to Jenkins, Kuch to karo. Kuch to karo. Halat bigar rahi hai. And Jen Jenkins actually said some very sensible things. But the question is, Ujjal Singh goes to Jenkins. He does not go to Muslim politicians. He does not go to Hindu politicians. He goes to the governor. Kuch to karo. We will negotiate with the empire. We will not negotiate with fellow Indians. Now, you all know about the Radcliffe Award. When it was agreed that, yes, India will be partitioned, Punjab will be partitioned, Bengal will be partitioned, so where to draw the line? So they agreed that there will be a commission. There will be a commission for the Punjab area, a commission for the Bengal area. And there will be two judges nominated by the Congress, two judges nominated by the Muslim League. And they will decide where to draw the line. And there would be another judge called Radcliffe, who will be the fifth judge and the chief judge. And the best lawyers were hired by all sides. 
So the Indian National Congress hired the services of Mr. M.C. Sethalwad. The Muslim League hired the services of Sir Zafrullah Khan. The Sikh Akali Dal hired the services of a prominent lawyer, Harnam Singh. Arguments took place. Radcliffe was not present. He was in Delhi. The, this, I'm talking now only of Punjab. The four judges were in Lahore. Radcliffe was in Delhi. The arguments take place. And then each of the four judges writes a separate opinion. Of course, the two Muslim judges write saying that so much of Punjab should come to Pakistan. The Hindu judge and the uh, Sikh judge uh, write different kinds of opinions. Now, and then Radcliffe gave his binding decision because, of course, these four did not agree with each other. But the question I ask is, why do we take it for granted that the four Indians on the Boundary Commission would give separate verdicts? The four were judges, they were not lawyers. They would have violated no norm or no convention had they sat down together and tried to reach an agreement. Supposing one of the four had said, wait a minute, we have heard the lawyers. The future of Punjab in India is at stake. Yes, Radcliffe can give a final opinion. Can we have a conversation to see if we can come to an agreement? That was not done. Next section. Solutions have to be devised at ground level. They cannot come from the top. I must return to this weightage question. You know, the, uh, because of the INC's campaign, the Minter Mali reforms came. Yes, there will be some, some councils Restricted franchise, not everybody can vote, only rich people can vote, only educated people can vote, but still they will be voting and Indians can be represented in these councils. And the uh, Hindus and Sikhs will have weightage, they will have higher percentage in the councils than their population uh, uh, justifies in Punjab, and Muslims will have a higher percentage than the population justifies uh, in UP. So although to begin with, Punjab's Sikhs and Hindus were unhappy with the separate electorates, and the, then they realized that weightage will work to their advantage, at least in Punjab. Um, now, already the Hindus and Sikhs in Punjab, they had been better educated. Uh, they were very strong in all their professions. Doctors, professors, engineers were all Hindus and Sikhs. Very small percentage of Muslims. In, although the Muslims were more than 50% of the population of Punjab, well more than 50%, their percentage in schools and colleges was Chauda Pandra. They, they wanted more opportunities in schools and colleges. But Hindus and Sikhs in Punjab felt that, well, we have worked hard, we have struggled to achieve these uh, positions in education and in the councils, uh, we, we, we have earned this weightage. And so they, they were not happy with this campaign for the greater possibilities for the Muslims of Punjab. Uh, so Mr. Jinnah in 1927 and 1928 comes with some very interesting proposals. These are worth looking at. Jinnah made a valiant bid for a nation, nationalist accord on the basis of a bargain. He said Muslims will accept joint electorates. Muslims will accept joint electorates in exchange for three things. One, that in Punjab and Bengal, the assemblies will have a Muslim majority. The population are majority Muslim. But because of weightage and because of education and so forth, uh, in practice, this doesn't seem to work. So we must have a guarantee that there will be a Muslim majority in Punjab and a Muslim majority in Bengal. That is one condition. The other is that Sindh province should be separated from Bombay presidency. It was Sindh was then part of Bombay. And they wanted a Muslim majority province. So they wanted Sindh separated from Bombay. And the third was that there should be one-third reservation for Muslims in any central assembly. One-third in the central assembly. 
Now, the Muslim population was one-fourth, but they wanted, Jinnah said, we must have one-third. But he was willing to say, on this basis, we can have joint electorates. And there was a meeting in Calcutta of all political parties to discuss this. Um, and they turned this down. They said, we can agree to increase the Muslim percentage in the assembly from 25 to 27. But we cannot agree to a Muslim majority government in Punjab. We cannot agree to a Muslim majority government in Bengal. And they were willing to, yes, Sindh can become a separate province. So the, uh, now the interesting thing is that Lala Lajpat Rai was the great leader of Punjab. And he was uh, attacked, as many of you know, by Lati's, and he died thereafter in 1928, just before this conference took place in Calcutta. Shortly before his death, Lajpatra had pointed out that thanks to their numbers, Muslims had become dominant in Punjab anyway, despite minority weightage. If, added Lajpatra, Punjab's Hindus and Sikhs were willing to forego weightage they would secure joint electorates in Hindu majority portions of India and at the center also. So he was in favor of this, but he had died by this time. In publicly taking this position, Lajpatra had dissented from most Hindu and Sikh leaders in his province. Who can tell whether Punjab's story would have taken a different course had the Lion of Punjab, as people called him, lived longer? Now, when the Congress turned down this proposal in Calcutta, they turned it down because of pressure from the Hindu and Sikh politicians of Punjab. So this again shows that it is not at the All India level that a solution can come. It, has, it had to come in Punjab. Um, now next point. Great struggles were at times weakened because potential allies were judged to be unworthy. Now again, talking about Punjab, neither Punjab's political leaders nor the All India Congress tried seriously to unite Punjabis across the class divide between landed aristocrats and the rest or across the communal divide. There was a party called the Unionist Party, which ruled Punjab for 20 plus years. This was a party of all large landowners, Sikhs, Muslims and Hindus. Now, Gandhi asked Punjabis of different faiths to settle with one another and struggle against the empire. For three years, the three communities jointly fought the empire. However, once the Khilafat issue disappeared, each group in Punjab, whether Muslim, Hindu, or Sikh, chose to settle with the empire and struggle against the other groups. So thereafter, the pro-Raj position of the Unionist Party and the communal stance of Punjab's Hindu, Sikh, and Muslim leaders proved more appealing then Gandhi's message of non-dependence on the empire coupled with Hindu-Muslim-Sikh unity. This was not surprising for the empire, had much to give. The jobs the empire could dangle, including with the army, were a strong draw in Punjab. The empire could also offer canal ca colony lands and ministerships. But Punjab's communities also had a great deal to offer each other. They could offer peace in the street and the countryside. They could offer the benefits of trade, and support in the struggle for independence. This truth could have been brought home to all Punjabis, I suppose, but the Punjab Congress, let us remember, the Punjab Congress was always too urban and too Hindu. It was a party in the cities of Punjab. 19 and 1920, Fazli Hussain was the president of the Punjab Congress and the president of the Punjab Muslim League, both. He took an active part in the struggle over the Rowlett Act. Afterwards, he starts this Unionist Party. He starts to collaborate with the empire. So here is this Punjab situation. And the Unionist Party, which has Sikh landlords, Hindu landlords, as well as some landowners or not big landlords, small-scale landlords, so this is a party of Muslim landlords, Hindu landlords, Sikh landlords, and it is collaborating with the empire. But a great many Punjabis are supporting this party. 
In fact, Gandhiji tries to build some links also with the Unionist Party. Because he realizes that if we are to make any progress in Punjab, Congress, for whatever reason, is limited to, uh, to the cities and to the Hindus. You have the Muslim League that is now fighting for something very different. Should you fight both the Muslim League and the Unionist Party? That was a difficult choice. But most Congress leaders in Punjab said we will have absolutely nothing to do with the Unionist Party. And most progressive congressmen across India said we should have no negotiations with the Unionist Party. But the Unionist Party had many influential leaders like Fazli Hussain, who once was a very strong Congress figure, who had fought on the role at issue. But there was no negotiation with him. He was, because he was collaborating with the empire, he had become untouchable. So this is also, so I sort of reached this kind of conclusion. In opting to fight both the Muslim League and the Unionists, the Punjab Congress had taken on one foe too many. Now, why has India remained a democracy? This is the last of my sections. Yes, India is a highly unsatisfactory democracy, but it's a democracy nonetheless. Now, some people think that India is a democracy because the British were wonderful and charitable imperialists. There is some truth in this. However, there are other countries that the British also ruled that did not embrace democracy fully or for long. Think of Burma, think of Egypt, think of Pakistan, to name only three. We have to concede that provincial autonomy under the British and the decorative yet not entirely toothless councils of the British certainly helped India to learn some aspects of democracy. But there were two other factors that I think are worth looking at. One was that the non-violent struggle, which was a large though not the sole feature of our freedom movement, also helped our democracy. If the gun or the bomb had been embraced as the primary weapon for winning freedom, those with guns would probably have had a stronger chance of ruling India. Let me repeat this. If the gun had been the primary weapon for freedom, the gun would have been a strong force for ruling India after freedom. Secondly, the leaders of the freedom movement, in particular Gandhi, set, some, set a good example by accepting defeats in elections and discussions. Uh, I don't know how many are aware of this. The number of times that Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhiji, M.K. Gandhi was defeated in discussions and debates inside the Congress. Again and again and again. There was in 1924 a big Congress meeting in Ahmedabad here. And the, some Englishmen had been murdered. And Gandhi wanted a resolution condemning that murder. But there was a very strong opposition against that resolution. The resolution was won, but it was nearly defeated. Uh, and there were other issues on, on, on let's boycott all British goods, said some people. Gandhi said, no, we're only boycotting foreign cloth. He had his own reason for this. But he was almost defeated here in Ahmedabad in 1924. He was very shaken. He was defeated and humbled, but he bounced back. Then in October 1939, just after the war started, I don't know whether many of you are aware, Gandhi's first proposal was that India should offer unilateral, non-violent moral support to the war. Sardar opposed it, Jawaharlal opposed it, everybody opposed it. Totally opposed it. Totally and completely opposed it. Gandhi was disappointed, but he accepts it. Then in Bardoli 1941, Rajaji and the others proposed negotiations with the British. Gandhiji is not for it. He is defeated. He accepts it. Of course, you all know about April 1947, the Gandhi's proposal that Jinnah should be given a chance to form a ministry. It was not such an innocent proposal as, as people think, because the proposal also said if Jinnah does not accept the offer, then the same offer should be given to the Congress to form a ministry for a united India. Sardar opposed it. Jawaharlal opposed it. Congress opposed it, Rajaji opposed it, Mountbatten opposed it. You all know, of course, don't you, or you should know, that there was this very talented, brilliant, gifted civil servant 
working for the Viceroy at the time. His name was V.P. Menon. And V.P. Menon wrote a paper, and this is in the Transfer of Power volumes. The paper of V.P. Menon was Tactics to be Adopted to Defeat Gandhi's Plan. He doesn't say Mr. Gandhi. Generally, the British were very correct in these matters. They always referred to people. Even these people were sent to jail, were called Mr. But Menon was so keen that we should now stop this plan. Tactics to be adopted. Yes, so Mountbatten and the Congress leaders together said, no, this plan we should, we should dismiss. Gandhi again accepted defeat. He wrote to Mountbatten that, except for Bhatshya Khan, nobody else agrees with me, so now you negotiate with Patel and Nehru, not with me. Then, there was a discussion again in the summer of 47 on two issues where again Gandhi was defeated. Gandhi wanted Hindustani to be the language, not Hindi. Hindustani. There's no great difference between Hindi and Hindustani. But Gandhi felt that Hindustani was something that all Indians might accept, Muslims and Hindus. Congress defeated him. Then there was a defeat on what? A very personal, deep matter for Gandhi. Who remembers this? The big defeat for Gandhi. It was on the flag. Because Gandhi wanted the charkha. Jawaharlal said no. The Ashoka Chakra is more elegant. In his reply, Gandhi said, all right, I'll accept this, but I think the charkha is more elegant. <laughs> uh, now, what did Gandhi have at this stage in his life? He was very old, he didn't have money, he had his charkha. He was deeply attached to it. He had designed the flag. And uh, so that too was denied him. He was defeated on that one too. This is what Gandhi says finally, when he accepts the change. There is not much difference between the new and the old flag except that the old one was a little more elegant. Then he says, looking at the Ashoka Chakra, some may recall that Prince of Peace, King Ashoka, ruler of an empire who renounced power. He represented all faiths. He was an embodiment of compassion. Seeing the Charkha in his Chakra adds to the glory of the Charkha. Ashoka's Chakra represents the eternally revolving divine law of Ahimsa. Now, Gandhi lost, he was humbled, he was heartbroken, yet he continued to be part of the team. He continued to back Nehru and Patel and Rajendra Babu, Rajaji and others. He did not start a new party. It was a lesson in democracy. When the tallest and the strongest, when the tallest and the strongest accept their defeat and continue to play on the field, democracy gets strengthened. That is it. So my last point. The first cabinet of independent India. Yes, it was finally, the cabinet was chosen chiefly by Nehru and Patel. But Gandhi also had discussions with Nehru and Patel. He made several suggestions. So apart from Nehru, who was prime minister, Patel was deputy prime minister, and Rajan Babu, the future president, the cabinet had 14 in all, including these three. Who were the others? One woman, Rajkumar Ramrit Kaur. I think they could have had more than one woman, but one woman. Two Muslims, Maulana Azad and Jawaharlal's associate in UP, Rafi Ahmed Kidwai. Two scheduled caste leaders, Ambedkar and Jagjeevan Ram. Two Christians, John Mathai and Rajkumari Amrit Kaur. Two former and future foes of the Congress, Dr. Ambedkar and Shama Prasad Mukherjee of the Hindu Mahasabha. Former foes of the Congress and future foes of the Congress. They were in the cabinet. A Sikh, Sardar Baldev Singh. A Parsi, C.H. Bhabha. A former loyalist of the Raj, R.K. Shanmukham Chetty who became the finance minister. And altogether, seven from outside the Congress in a cabinet of 14. So the inclusiveness of this first cabinet, the independence that each enjoyed in it, the role that Dr. Ambedkar played with the Constitution, these two were among the factors that strengthened Indian democracy.